Good evening. Welcome to the Educational Affairs Committee meeting for Tuesday, December 21st. Um, the first start to the meeting, we will do roll call and I will just call board members um, as I see you. So, um, Ms. Henry. Present. Mr. Cohen. Present. Mr. Epps. Present. Mr. Fishbein. You're muted, Mr. Fishbein. Actually, <laughs> I coughed right when I said present, <laughs> but I'm present. Okay. Um, Ms. Mulhern. Present. Mr. Schultz. Present. Ms. Haywood. Present. Hopefully I got everyone there and Ms. Lohman present. Next on the agenda is approval of the minutes of the November um, 23rd Educational Affairs Committee meeting. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Henry. The minutes are approved. So next I'm going to turn the meeting over to Dr. Smith to give us an overview of what we'll be hearing about tonight. Good evening, Dr. Smith. Good evening, Ms. Loman. Good evening to the um, rest of our school board of directors, as well as our Sheltenham School District community. Tonight's Ed Affairs um, Committee meeting, we have approximately four topics, um, I believe. Can we go to our next slide? And tonight's agenda is um, four topics. The first topic um, I will be facilitating, and this is around the American Rescue Plan um, funds, also known as ESSER three. We will also have course proposals from the high school, as well as an update on graduation requirements, and also the social studies course resequencing that impacts grades seven through 12. And our director of secondary education, Ms. Collins, will take the last three agenda items. Next slide, please. And as always, um, we revisit our mission and our vision statement. And myself and Ms. Collins, as facilitators for tonight, we made sure that our presentation and its contents reflect the mission and vision of the Sheltonham School District. And to get started, again, the first agenda item that I'll be facilitating is the American Rescue Plan, ARP Act of 2021 also known as ESSER 3. ESSER is the acronym for Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. ARP is the third iteration of ESSER for us. Um, the second bullet point points to the fact that Pennsylvania um, is uh, a state that has 5 billion in ESSER funds, ESSER 3 funds, in order to support the long-term work of edu education recovery. And also um, it tells you that 90% or 4.5 billion of the fund will flow to schools and it will receive an amount proportional to our federal one title one uh, a funds that we received um, in 2020 under the ESSA act. Next slide, please. The Sheldonham school district allocation of their $4.5 billion to the state is 3,930,000. 30,515. And so the next few slides walk you through, um, if you will, a, a kind of an FAQ um, of ESSER 3 to give you some general information. And so the first question is, when will we receive the funding? Our application is complete. Our application has been submitted. Once um, the application is submitted, we will begin receiving funds. This is a reimbursement fund, so we do not receive the funds in advance. So we have not received, for example, $3.9 million or anything similar to it. We spend the money first, we submit um, reimbursement, and then we are reimbursed so long as it meets the um, criteria for ESSER 3. Can we use funds prior to ESSER to the to, to S? Can we use ESSER 3 funds prior to um, the cost being incurred and the question and the answer to that is yes. So what that means is, for example, we can go back to any date from March 13th, 2020 
to the current date to be reimbursed for ESSER. So for example, we have we incurred costs in March and in April in order to pivot to our remote learning uh, model. Back then, we didn't know we were gonna get ESSER three funds. So now that we have those funds, we can absolutely go back as long as they're allowable expenses and apply it to anything that begins on March 13, 2020 to the current date. The next question is, what is the period of spending? How long do we have to spend it? And the answer to that question is March 13th, 2020 to September 30th, 2024. That means any receipts, any reimbursements that we submit for ESSER 3, they must fall within those dates. And then the question is, must all the expenditures occur by the end of the grant? And the question, the answer to that question is we have 90 days after the end of the grant on September 30th, 90, 90, 2024, in order for us to spend. So we have a, 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 if you will, for lack of a better term, somewhat of a grace period. So 90 days after the grant is at its close on September 30th, 2024, we must make sure that all of our obligations and reimbursements have been submitted by that time. And there's an example on, I'm sorry, can you go back one slide, please? Yes, and there's an example uh, under the second bullet telling you that, for example, if an LEA, and the LEA is the local education agency, and in this case, our LEA is the Sheltonham School District, if we enter into a contract and the date cannot extend beyond third, September 30th, 2024, however, we can make payments up to 90 days after that date. So our work and our engagement must be done by the 30th of 2024 in September. However, we still have 90 days afterwards to settle um, our business. Next slide, please. Can we use the funds for multi-year contracts? Absolutely. So it does not have to be, we get services, we pay in one-shot deals, we can have multi-year contracts. However, we are still bound to that date to end on September 30th, 2020, 2024. Unlike Esther 3, we do not have to provide emergency aids to non-public schools. So the $3.9 million or so that the Sheltonham School District received does not have to be allocated to any of our non-public schools. Is stakeholder engagement required? The answer to this question is yes. ESSER 1 and ESSER 2 did not require, and the key word here is required. It did not require us to engage stakeholders. Even if there was engagement at ESSER 1 and ESSER 2, that engagement um, was something that, that was, was something that the Sheltonham School District may have elected to do. What makes this different is we do not have the opportunity to say whether or not we're going to do it. Not only do we have to do it, we have to develop a plan to show that we have engaged um, stakeholders. And this is a different requirement um, from ESSER 1 and ESSER 2. And um, the, the requirement goes a step further to tell you who your stakeholders um, should be. So stakeholders extend beyond parents, it extends beyond teachers, it extends beyond um, the usual people that we normally point to when we discuss stakeholders. Stakeholders also include civil rights organizations. It includes um, any organizations that we work with with children experiencing homelessness, um, youth in foster care, uh, organizations, for example, that we can choose to engage with could be the local NAACP. Um, our local library system is also an example of a group that we can engage with. So this particular funding requires us to reach out and make sure that we are engaging our stakeholders with the plan, that we ask all of our stakeholder groups for their feedback, their input, their thoughts, their recommendations for what they think is best um, with the $3.9 million in ESSER 3 funding. Next slide, please. And so the question is, how will we engage um, stakeholders? We are going to host um, a series of virtual meetings. Those virtual meetings will take place in the day, as well as we're going to offer evening um, hours as well. 
so that we make sure that we're as flexible and as open to everyone's schedule. We know for some people meeting in the day is better. And for some of our stakeholders, it may be more advantageous to meet in the evening. We are going to advertise those meetings through social media, through our news share, and also on our website, letting different stakeholders know when their meetings will be hosted. We will also um, formulate a Google form for stakeholders who may not be able to attend a meeting for whatever reason there may be. So if someone can't attend a meeting, they will still be able to fill out a Google form and state how they think or how they recommend or they suggest that we use um, some of our ESSER three funding. Next slide, please. And so before making a recommendation or suggestion, where are the guidelines or requirements? And so we will be posting those guidelines and requirements. It is a um, hyperlink that you can see on my screen. That hyperlink leads you to a 34 um, page document. Tonight's presentation seeks to kind of uh, um, summarize that document so that you don't have to go through the entire document, but we're making it available for those who want to take a deeper dive. And basically, um, if you look at that document, it will tell our stakeholders before they make a recommendation, before they make a suggestion, what is allowable and what isn't allowable to uh, spend um, regarding ESSER three funding. Next slide, please. And just as a preview, approved usage of funds include facilities and grounds updates, because any of these things that impact our return to instruction, our recovery for our educational program will be funded. So facilities and grounds up, up, updates are included. Um, any of our program services, resources around social, emotional health and wealth, um, health and wellness will be included. Staff um, recruitment, support and retention are included because as you all know, as, as a lot of industries and education is, has not been immune um, for different reasons, um, it's been difficult to get um, everyone back at full force in terms of staffing. So we can use these funds to help us in our staffing efforts. Also, we can use these funds for mm -hmm. academic recovery and acceleration, as well as systemic equity and family and community partnerships. So those are the big broad buckets of what we can use the funds um, for. But again, the focus is, is to make sure however we use these funds and whatever, whatever uh, category we determine that the funds fall under, that the big picture is academic and education recovery for the children of the Shelton Hume School District. So next steps, um, beginning in January, 2022, it, it seems like um, January just kind of crept up on us, but it, it is almost here. So beginning next month um, at the 2022 um, mark, we are going to begin to schedule the meetings for all of our stakeholders. I listed those stakeholders earlier. What I will tell you is um, parent meetings and student meetings, secondary students in particular will take place at the school level. Um, for our families. So just so you know, you'll either hear from the Office of Education or you'll hear directly from your school. So for example, we're asking our building principals to coordinate meetings and to coordinate these sessions with PTOs as opposed to higher level at the central office to talk specifically about what they believe recommendations and suggestions could be for their specific schools. So there will be some things that will be school district wide and there will be some recommendations that will be special to Sheltonham High School or maybe special to a program or things that are going on at Myers or something that specifically speaks to the data that we see at the Winco Elementary School. Next slide, please. And that concludes the first agenda item. So I will pause here um, and turn things back over to our committee chair, uh, Ms. Loman. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you for that overview of the SR3 um, engagement requirements. I'm going to first open up the floor to board member questions um, about this portion of the presentation. I do see in the chat that there is a question um, that's related to the second half of the presentation from a community member, and we'll hold off on that until we get to that part of the presentation. But for now, if you're a board member, right? Now, and you have a question um, about this particular portion of the presentation, please raise your hand and I'll call on you. If you're a community member and you have a question about this portion of the presentation, you can also raise your hand and we can unmute you and I can call on you. But let's see, 
Let me first start with, uh, I first saw Mr. Burdell Williams hand go up. Thank you, Mrs. Lohman, and, uh, and thank you, uh, Dr. Smith, for the presentation. I know this is, a, uh, as co-chair of facilities, I'm actually genuinely excited about this, but I also do want to just ask one question, um, just regarding how much of the ESRA 3 funds we have already committed. I think it would just be important from an informational perspective to just understand um, how much if any, we have spent, I know we just submitted our, our, our grant. So it sounds like maybe we haven't spent any money because we don't have the, the approval for the, uh, the reimbursement yet, but just wanted to put that out there, not just for myself or for the board, but also for the community to understand as well. So we haven't committed or dedicated any funds or any programs or projects um, in the name of ESSER 3. However, of course, um, you know, in terms of planning, we do have some ideas of what we'd like to um, use the funds for. So once we have these community meetings and stakeholder input, the hope is that some of the suggestions and recommendations align to what we um, have in place. And so at the end of this process, if you will, we'll gather all of the suggestions, all of the recommendations. I'll meet with the superintendent and we'll decide based on the recommendations, suggestions, they'll be prioritized to make sure um, that uh, the priority items are taken care of first. We do have ESSER two funds um, as well that are still um, remaining. And we may decide to use some of those recommendations and put them in the ESSER two bucket as well. Um, and, and, and another thing is I don't expect um, a huge differential between um, what some of us are already thinking about and what community members and, and others will think about because while we haven't done a formal process, we have heard um, you know, from faculty, from students, and also from community members what they believe they would like to see in order for us to take our students and our district um, in, in the right direction. So nothing, is, nothing has been set in stone, nothing has been settled. And even though we've submitted our application, there is a time period where we can go back and we can amend the application to show that we're going to do something differently if, if necessary. Got you. Yeah, I'll, I'll hold off on any questions regarding the strategy behind that um, until we kind of get into the process, but I, I, I appreciate that, that update. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Berdo Williams. I saw your hand up next, Mr. Fishbein. Thank you, Ms. Lohman. Um, the slide 16 has the uh, areas of approved usages of funds and <clears throat> both um, trauma sensitive schools, health, wellness, and staff recruitment, support, and retention um, speak to something that we've heard a lot about from the community, which is do we need more counselors? seems to me that, that 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 area of need given the manifestation of some pretty serious social and emotional problems that we've been seeing uh, is almost an emergency and uh, putting that out there as one area for use of those funds and that's all i had thank you thank you Um, thank you, Mr. Fishbein. I saw Mr. Epps had his hand up next. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, thanks, Dr. Smith and team for the presentation. Uh, you addressed a couple of my questions already in terms of the intentions to engage students at a school level. Um, and even that it sounds like uh, stakeholders are able to offer I original ideas that are their own. Um, so continuing, in, um, continuing down that stream, and staying on slide 16, out of curiosity for the suggestions that were already um, received, do they fall under like a, any number of these, sort of all of them, or any are, are they all gathering under a certain area with, of approved um, funds that you all know of? I would say that we've received so far suggestions and recommendations that fall in all of the um, recommended categories. Uh, and thank you. And then as a follow-up, it sounds like there's discretion for the district to use these funds on recurring costs. 
It is, as long as it falls within that window and doesn't extend beyond September 30th, 2024. So yes. Thanks. Would it be the intention, uh, jumping ahead a little bit, but is that, would that be um, on the table to use these funds for recurring costs? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Epps and Dr. Smith. And then uh, Mr. Cohen, I see your hand. Yes, thank you. Following up on the last two comments, I just want to urge some caution and consideration where if there are new recurring costs that are being considered as part of this, that we think about it very hard and carefully in that because of our financial position, I realize that certainly having some additional full-time staff versus outsourcing has benefits. But again, it's something that I think we have to look at in a bigger context, notably budgetary concerns not at the expense of delivering a good program, but in my mind, I do want to see that be considered as part of the equation and part of the factors before we commit ourselves to some long-term costs going forward after these funds expire. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cohen, for those comments. Um, any other board members with any questions before I open up this portion to uh, public questions or comments? Oh, Mr. Burdell Williams. Yeah, just just a comment. Um, I, I would I would hope that just from a prioritization perspective, that the criteria that the district would use would be available um, at some point. Just from a perspective of understanding, I don't know. Looking at the list uh, on slide sixteen, I know it's relatively broad and covers a lot of uh, a lot of subject areas for us. Um, but, you know, not sure, right, I'm in a, you know, professional environment where we prioritize, you know, you know, people safety, quality, uh, delivery, and cost, um, pretty specifically. So I just would um, just ask that, you know, the criteria that we use, you know, to evaluate priority, that that is, um, you know, at, at least understood, um, while this is, the decisions are being made. Uh, thank you, Mr. Burdell Williams. That's a, that's actually a very very good point. Thank you for making that point. Um, I see Ms. Haywood just raised her hand. Yes. Um, thank you, Ms. Sloman, and thank you, Dr. Smith. Very quick question in terms of stakeholders. Um, I know there's a wide span of stakeholders that we really want to engage. Um, as just one board member, I'd like to get a list of those stakeholders that we're reaching out to. Um, just you know, for full transparency. Um, is that possible that to get that? Well, <laughs> is it possible to get that list? <laughs> yes. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, do I have any other um, board members who have any other questions before I open this particular portion up to the public. I don't, I don't see anybody. I'm, so I'm going to um, open up this portion of the presentation up to the public to see if you have any questions or comments. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Um, let us know the area of the township in which you reside or if you're an employee of the district. Um, and we can unmute you. I don't see anybody, any members of the public who have any questions for this particular portion. So I think we can move on, Dr. Smith and Ms. Collins, to the next portion of the presentation. Thank you. So the next um, three agenda items will be facilitated by Ms. Collins, starting off with the Sheltonham High School course proposals. Ms. Collins. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we will present um, course proposals for Shellingham High School for implementation um, and for the 2022-2023 school year. As you all know, uh, this school year, we developed a new modified schedule at Shellingham High School. And in implementing the new schedule, what we have realized that we need to increase our course electives for our students to provide them with different opportunities and to ensure that we have um, multiple course 
multiple courses to meet the needs of all of our students. So what's gonna be presented tonight are recommended courses that are coming from the high school. Um, Dr. Hammond is also joining me on the call this evening. As you all know, he does the schedule for the high school, but he works with the department chairs and soliciting the course um, descriptions. And then he and I meet to review the courses along with Dr. Lahara to move forward for recommendation and approval by you. Dr. Hammond. Good evening, everybody. Um, tonight, I have 10 courses to share with you. Uh, one from the math department, three from the science, one from English, one from music, one from the art department, and two courses from, there are two courses from phys ed, and then there's one other special course that we'll be sharing. So a total of 10. Um, as Ms. Collins said, we, we saw the need for more electives to be added to the schedule to fit into the course um, to allow more meaningful options for scholars as they pick their courses and they fill out the, the full schedule because with our new modified schedule, there are more uh, choices that scholars get to, to um, include in their day um, than we used to have in the traditional schedule. Um, one thing I will point out about all of the courses before I begin is that there is no need for any additional staffing. It is all, it all can be incorporated with our current staff that we have. And um, the only costs are some curricular costs for materials. So the first course that I will talk about is discrete mathematics. In the math department, once a scholar makes it to algebra two, the only options that a scholar has is probability and statistics, and then pre-calc if they're taking um, regular math classes. Um, as we push more students to take our, our programming classes, which is you know like our intro to programming or our AP programmings, we need other options to counter those so that students can take additional types of math classes. So one course, as you see here, is discrete math. This course is designed currently as a minor, which would actually run perfect connecting with a intro to programming or any other minor that we offer or when students take our year long courses, another minor. You can turn that page, um, Ms. Collins. Our teacher that proposed it, there's a couple books that we are narrowing down. We're, we're getting them in. Ms. Collins has them ordered coming in and so that we can sit down and review them and pick the best one that are, will be best for our scholars. But that is the only cost, about $5,900 for those textbooks with no cost to students or families. The next course comes from our science department. It's one of three courses, neuroscience, which I don't know about you guys, but that sounds pretty interesting to me. In fact, these three science courses sound really interesting to me. Um, I wish I had an opportunity to take these next three courses. <clears throat> but again, in science, there's not many electives that most of our students want to sign up and take. Um, we have environmental science, we have marine science, we have microbiology. Um, these are the ones that are in addition to our biology, chemistry, physics. Um, but when it comes to filling in our minor sections, there's not many options. And so as, as Ms. Collins said, I worked with the department chairs to develop these extra minors. So turn a page on this one. Again, as I said about being excited, you'll, you'll see these materials, the course materials. One, the curriculum is coming from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, we would be purchasing a brain model and a sagittal uh, section of a sheep brain, um, which I, I, I just, you know, I, I get excited just thinking about that right there. Um, but the approximate cost is $207 for those materials based on the number of sections that we would offer. The next course, Forensic Science, and we're 
I'm going to actually include the, the third course with this because it's forensic science too. Um, who doesn't love watching CSI? And that's what I think of when I'm thinking of this class. But again, it is a minor. It is a minor that in science, one of the difficult things of offering courses is that our science teachers are certified in their subject matter. But this is a course that any of the science teachers could teach based on their certification. So it even opens up a lot more than, than any of the other courses that we offer. The only other course that we have that is, is flexible that way is environmental science. Give you some time to read the screen. This one, the online science lab is the cost for these courses. But that is a six year subscription and you'll see 75 classes, that's several classes that would be operating over those years. And so what we proposed is a forensic science one and a forensic science two. Of course, we understand that forensic science two would not run until the 22-23 school year, but we proposed it now so that we didn't have to go through the process next year. Next in the English department, Latino and African-American literature. This is actually a course since I've been in the high school, um, we've wanted to propose um, over, over time. And now it actually is a perfect opportunity to fit because again, we need more minor electives in our schedule. Um, <clears throat> the interesting part of this course is that as they study poetry and short stories and the novels, they're looking at them through the lens of the different cultures, but they're breaking them down into those uh, five major themes, the roots, the history and culture, family, identity and self, um, and mar marginalization. So I really do feel that our, our scholars can get a lot out of this. Um, the only similar type of course we have like this in the, in the high school is our African-American studies course. And we've been talking for years that we need more than that. So this is a, a, a great course that, you know, really will play towards our, our scholars' interests and, and get more students wanting to take more meaningful minors throughout their, their, their school day. And again, the only cost is for the course materials. This proposed course, the Diversified Occupations Program, this year, um, with the pilot under, under Brittany McKenna, who is actually a special education teacher at the high school, but went back to school for her, her CTE licensure. So with that being said, she came to us in, I want to say, fall of 19, 2019, um, we proposing that we consider offering this program. And what the program allows is for our students at the high school to participate in a work skills CTE program coursework. And then in addition to that, have placement in approved co-op program. This year under our current course selection, we were able to pilot the program under Ms. McKenna's lead. And she has done a phenomenal job working with the counselors to recruit students and to engage our community partners with place, for placements of our students. This particular program is offered to seniors and they take um, their regular courses. They take two regular classes in the morning. They then take the seminar for the diverse occupations program and then they go out to their job placement. In addition, this program meets the pathways for high school graduation now um, approved by PDE in regards to having an approved uh, career or technical based opportunity where students can have a co-op experience. Since we currently did, are doing the pilot, we are, we are unable to uh, apply for the actual approval from PDE for, as an approved program. So with this course approval, we will then move forward with the PDE approval. And Ms. McKenna has ensured that we have all of our documentation in place. 
We have reached out to our community partners. We have begun conversations with Montgomery County Community College. We're looking forward to meeting with our, um, our partners at Arcadia around also having the opportunity for students to receive college credits like they would if they were attending Eastern. Ms. McKenna saw the need as a special education teacher because we have students that obviously apply for Eastern but can't get in. However, through this program, we're able to provide opportunities for students who are not only looking to go graduate on a career path, but also on also con considering continuing their studies at the collegiate level. She has worked with Ms. Shafron. In addition to other teachers in our building to help place students in, in a variety of placements throughout the district. So for example, we currently have 21 students in the program. We have 18 students who are placed in approved co-op program. And this means that the co-op, the, where they, their work location has decided to, has determined to one, get the appropriate clearances to have our students on site. They complete a training plan and agreement where the student, the organization, and the parent agrees upon what students will do while at the work placement. And like, so it's a contract agreement between the student, the school, and the, con and the employer. And with that, they also provide on-site job coaching. Ms. McKenna goes out to all the work sites, meet with all of our community partners, observes our students currently participating in the program. We have had some difficulties because of the fact that traveling and traveling limitations for some of our students, especially for those who are under 18. However, we, she's done, she's even solicited and gotten the van to help get kids to interviews. So Ms. McKenna, who's also on this call, has done a yeoman's job to ensure the success of this particular program. Because we've had such a great interest in this year with the pilot, we are moving forward for a course approval. This is a four credit course because they take two credits in the fall semester and two credits in the spring. They have to participate in a seminar class where they provide training. They have to take a preliminary NACTI test, just like our kids do at Eastern to see what their skills levels were. And then after that, she works through the program with them on, on how, how to do an interview, resume building, um, basic employment and, and skills that you need when you're going out to sell yourself for a, a job. Also looking at your career interests, we have students who are interested in computer programming who are actually doing an intern um, virtually in computer graphics. So we've had various opportunities for our students provided thus far this school year. So we see this as a beneficial piece in addition to the Sheltonham High School curricular offerings. At this time, like we said, Ms. McKenna is a special education teacher. She does spend um, one period a day still supporting the special education department. She does have a caseload, and then she spends the other half of her day focusing on the implementation of the program. If we were to um, move this to a full-time program, and it will be based upon student enrollment, whether or not it becomes her full day or still continues to remain part of her day, um, the support of a special education teacher, we will <clears throat> have to take another look at how we currently allocate our staff and determine where we can um, continue those additional supports to make sure that we maintain our special education program at the same level we do now. As you can see, the list of material resources And these particular costs are some of the costs that's anticipated. Obviously, the miles reimbursement because she has to travel to all the different locations and work sites numerous times a week. But then the NACTI exam cost is based upon each enrolled student, and that would be an annual cost. With this being said, there are numerous grant opportunities available to um, the district. Um, this is one movement that the, even at the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit, um, Ms. McKenna and I have met with our college and career readiness group. There's opportunity, they have even, they actually reimbursed 
the district for Ms. McKenna's course tuition for the last few courses at Temple University because they are invested in expanding these diverse occupations programs throughout the district. Currently, we do not have a comprehensive high school that offer, also offers the CTE model as, as such, where our kids can walk away with getting that NACTI um, certification and possibly college credit um, for their experience during their senior year on the co-op. With these grant opportunities, once our program is approved, we look forward to applying with them, for them to offset the cost of the, the licensure that we have to pay on an annual basis. In addition, like we said prior, um, Montgomery County Immediate Unit also has received funding as well to support schools efforts. And at this time, we know that Sheldonham School District, we are the first to pilot a program as such. And we know that Abington School District is looking to um, develop a program as well, but has not gone as far as we have to actually begin the pilot. The next course is from our music department, Beginner Band. Um, Beginner Band is being proposed as a way of providing our scholars with an opportunity to get back into music or to start that music career. Before this course, you pretty much had to already be involved in music in the previous years to really get into our music courses. Um, the concerts, concert um, um, strings and um, the wind ensembles and all that, the percussion. Um, this course will look at combining some of our current courses and then making them so that anybody can participate in even the students that don't have instruments we will be able to blend them the, the materials that we already have some of the instruments that we already have and already have purchased in our music department so that they can be a part of it and then continue to grow and then start from there so this is a course to basically help us continue to expand the music opportunities that we have at the high school. It is a one credit uh, full course as our other music courses are. Turn that page, please. And it is also a course that will allow students to take part in the pep band and then afterwards continue into wind ensembles and also join our jazz band. Again, no additional staffing because currently this course will allow us to combine our current sections to provide the room for this course to run in that place. The next course is our art department, sculpture art, um, sculpture 3D art. Currently, the only courses that we offer in this area is ceramics. And then we have our AP Art 3D. But there's not a course for a student that after they take ceramics, if they're not quite ready for AP, there's not a course for them in this area. So this provides them an opportunity to do that work as if they're taking the AP class, but continue to grow to get ready for that AP class. It is a minor. It could also run at the same time as the AP art class. So they could be with students that are in the AP, but they're just not having to do that same workload. And also I will point out that, um, and I think it actually started with the pandemic, our ceramics courses have, um, they have uh, skyrocketed in enrollment over the last year and a half. Um, they, they went from wondering if we were gonna continue running ceramics to not having enough sections to fit in all the students that were requesting. Um, so this, this does offer more students an opportunity to take a different course and to meet the needs of more students that are asking for this type of a course. Next page, please. And the last two courses, are coming from our phys ed department, an intro to Pilates and yoga class, 
Um, the current offerings in, in phys ed, um, you have healthy living, which is a regular gym class. It's not as intense, but it's still a gym class. Then you have your competitive team sports. You have your phys ed. We have unified phys ed. But they wanted something in the realm with, especially considering the times that we're in right now and more people need to be think, need to think about mindfulness. Um, so that's why they came up with this idea of offering an intro to Pilates and yoga. Um, students over the course of a semester, because it is a minor, will be introduced to Pilates, introduced to yoga, and practice them throughout those, the, those courses, which is every other day for that semester. Um, so it, it, it'll open up to another um, section of our students that, again, filling in minors into their schedule is very important. So taking a course that, you know, will meet some extra needs for them is important. So again, no additional staffing. We already own the yoga mats in the building and it's already included in our budget for replacing or getting extras if we need them. And the last course I, I, I think is very important for anybody is a swimming for non-swimmers course, a, in a, a, you know, a beginning swimmers class. We have a pool that is underutilized and it is, very important that we start taking advantage of that and, and providing our students with a com an opportunity to be comfortable in the pool, in the water. Um, we actually, from talking with uh, Ms. Collins and myself and the, the, the one teacher that is like the teacher lead in the phys ed department, this course could also start off with like a water aerobics just to get students comfortable and into the water and then start slowly teaching them their swimming skills. Um, I've always have been a good swimmer, but I have a lot of friends that are not comfortable swimmers and they are terrified when they get in the water. And it's very important that we make sure that our scholars are able to be comfortable in that, in that area. So it's another minor, a half credit course. And that is it with the new courses in the high school. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. So the teacher that teaches this course does need to be lifeguard certified. So the only cost for this course is reimbursing the cost to get our teachers to be lifeguard certified. Ms. Loman. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Collins and uh, Dr. Hammond for those um, presentations about those courses. They all sound great. And I had said this to Dr. Smith when she had presented them to us at I would really like to sign up for several of them. So <laughs> that could be made possible. I appreciate it. Um, but, um, so thank you for, for that. But um, no, seriously, um, so I, I'll first um, open this portion of the presentation up for questions to the board. And again, we'll go to um, questions um, then to the, from the public and the community. Um, I know there's there's a set of questions from one community member, and I'm thinking maybe we'll probably save those to the very end because they're rather long. But um, if any board members have any questions about this part of the presentation, uh, please raise your hands. Okay, Mr. Schultz, I see you're up first, and then Ms. Haywood. Thank you. Uh, it's always exciting to hear about the new, new courses, and uh, I, I always look forward to seeing the new stuff. One clarifying question around beginner bands. Um, will this be a pre, I, I saw a note in the description about it being a prerequisite course for later band things. Is that something that all students would have to, regardless of their history with music uh, in our district or, or ability through training, would they have to take this course? now or or would a student be able to not take beginner uh band if they are no are they are not beginners so i believe the um the thought process behind begin, beginner band is the fact that we want to be able to reach students that maybe stopped playing their interest instrument and want to get back into it or you know they they're picking it up at the high school level it would be a prerequisite for students in that area but students that have taken their music lessons or our courses beforehand, um, our select courses in the high school, you, you pretty much audition for them. 
So they Got would it. meet with the teacher and show their skills. And then the teacher would say, yes, you can sign up for that course. Great. That makes sense. That, that, that was my question. Thank you. No problem. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schultz, Ms. Haywood, and then Mr. Epps. Yes, um, thank you, Ms. Sloman, and thank you, Dr. Hammond. I have a lot of exciting new classes. Um, several questions um, I have. One is basically a process question, and that is, um, do we have an established criteria that we look at when we are deciding on adding a new course? Can you explain that a little bit more on what you mean by that? Sure. So um, do we basically, you know, I'm sure there's lots of maybe there are lots of requests from teachers to um, pilot a new course or to offer a new course. And when we're deciding, you, you presented 10 wonderful courses this evening. Um, when you were looking at those 10, were, were all of them looked at the same in terms of the criteria of um, possible student interest, um, whether this is more cutting edge? Is this something that is going in the direction of new standards, um, you know, new offerings that will put our, our students in a, you know, 21st century mindset. Um, just generally, what criteria do we look at when we are looking at offering a new course in our, anywhere in our schools? So, so Ms. Haywood, our, all of our teachers, when they submit the proposal, the course proposal is very detailed. This You have big picture highlights of the course proposal that was presented tonight, but it goes to the, uh, description, rationale, um, alignment to the standards, um, potential course, um, just like um, outline, a mapping out, and outcomes for student learning. So we review all the content that's submitted in those documents, and we may receive some that don't meet the standard of, doesn't really explain what the course is about. So those courses may be rejected or asked to, you know, come come back later, and we could further discuss this. And so we review them every based on the, the detailed um, course um, proposal form that they have to submit. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Um, and in doing that, do we? You know, when we're now offering 10 new classes, which is wonderful. The question is, are we also evaluating on an annual basis classes that are maybe not as well attended or as much interest in them or have become somewhat obsolete? Um, and are we then removing those from the course schedule as an offering? Yes, we do. And we also may not run courses that, you know, sometimes only two students select in course selection. So those courses will not run. Um, Speaking to courses that may be obsolete, sometimes it also has to deal with staffing and whether or not that the staff person can be repurposed in another way and, and or whether there's a different course that they could teach to, and to ensure that we meet our contractual agreements with CEA. So we review those, we review courses every year. Um, we'll be coming back again next year with additional proposals and possible um, requests in terms of um, staff reallocation. So as we continue to grow, I think we did get a little, you know, the pandemic just set us back a little bit just because of just trying to figure out where we are and everything, you know, and, and staffing and what we need moving forward with our new schedule. But we continue to review all of our course offerings every year because we're hoping to add more courses, but also keep it in mind the, the, the district's um, budget constraints to, to make sure that if we would like to bring in a new course that possibly requires additional staffing or a new staff member, that is it possible for us to do that by replacing it with someone who could possibly be retiring? So we are very conscientious about our, the budget constraints as well. Okay, and just a couple more questions. So I don't wanna monopolize the conversation, but in terms of um, civics, I see Mr. Hoff on the, the um, screen, hi. Um, I know that there is a requirement now in Pennsylvania that we really offer civics, um, civics really as a course. And I didn't see that anywhere kind of as the new course offerings unless I missed it. Um, and would be curious to find out where we are kind of in development of that because I do think it's critically important um, as a, a course, um, not just a concept. So we actually got that course approved, I think, I believe two years ago. Um, okay. And you will see in our future presentation in regards to where that fits in, in, in the new graduation requirements. 
Perfect, thank you. And just a couple of more questions very quickly. Um, for the Latino and African American literature course, it's great to see that. Um, the one theme that I saw that was missing possibly from that course, and I hope it's included maybe in, in another one of the themes, are really accomplishments because I see the marginalization, I see the history and culture, the roots, et cetera. And I would hope that the literature would also applaud the accomplishments within those two cultures as well. Absolutely. Okay. And my last question is related to the diversified occupations program. Um, I see Mr. Berto Williams has his hand up, so he may have some questions as well as it relates to Eastern. Um, so I'm not going to ask any Eastern related questions, but um, it's a four credit um, course. Great that the students have an opportunity to have kind of a work study um, option. Um, are those credits, would those credits being earned be applied towards any of the graduation requirements such as science? I didn't see kind of where they would fit in because that's really like the, that's like a major, right? It is it isn't major. They could fit as elective credit similar to what Eastern does. It depends on what their work co-op experience is, whether or not we could apply to a science, um, towards a science credit as we do, depending on what students are doing at Eastern as well. Um, so it would be a case by case basis, but we have, the, the difference with this co-op is that it is approved, is, is a work experience for our students where they get like firsthand, some are working in a pharmacy at the local, at a Walgreens. Some are actually doing, um, um, working at like Sussman Auto. So they have different experiences. That's paid experience, but more importantly, they get on the job coaching um, and that the um, employer has agreed to do that as a community partner with us. And, and there's a curriculum component that's really aligned with, the, with our state standards? Uh, yes, absolutely. And this is one of the approved, um, at the beginning of last school year, I introduced a new approved course pathways for graduation. This is one of the approved requirements for graduation so that our students can have this particular experience. But every all this aligns with the college and career readiness standards um, of PDE. Okay, thank you. That concludes all of my questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Haywood, for all, all those great questions. Um, Mr. Epps, you're up next, and then Mr. Verdo Williams. Thank you, Ms. Lohman. Um, and again, thanks for the presentation from the team. Certainly encouraged as well to see the course offerings as uh, someone who studied criminology and criminal justice, forensic science, or something you couldn't take until maybe your junior year. And so seeing that it's offered in high school, um, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, and so in term, um, focusing on the diversified occupation, Ms. Collins, you referenced a contract that's in place, an approval process for businesses. Um, could you share um, what are some of the criteria the district looks at to approve a business? Yes, first of all, the employer has to be willing to participate in a meaning, meaningful um, work-based experience for our students. They have the training agreement requires that they list exactly the type of um, coaching and training and mentoring they're gonna provide our student. The fact they must maintain communication with Ms. McKenna throughout this process with regular check-ins and feedback to our student in regards to their progress on site. They create, they develop a training plan, which not only just the, between the district and the, the um, employer, it also includes the student and the student's parent or guardian. Um, with that being said, um, and they also have to ensure that they get the appropriate clearances like we require for anyone who comes into our building to be around our, our students. We have had um, employees who have not followed through with the clearances so therefore we cannot place our students there we take that very seriously and then we ensure that it uh, this program is the the description for what we can do is very as detailed and prescribed by pde and we follow those guidelines exactly because we want approval for p from pde to continue with the program and that'll open us up to funding as well, additional funding sources. Right, I, I appreciate that. I, I under, I'm glad you referenced PDE. I wasn't sure how much local entities may have had some discretion in adding or taking away from some of those things. Um, 
And so uh, there was also collaboration, critical thinking, problem solving skills, a lot of what we also talk about with project based learning is very similar. Um, to what extent, if any, is growth in those areas measured? Well, because they take, well, one assessment is the NACTI assessment. They take it, but actually, because Mr. McKenna is the teacher, she couldn't proctor it. So I actually went to the high school to proctor the first level NACTI exam for our students. So they take that in the beginning. I'll go back and we'll monitor the growth that way. In addition, Ms. McKenna does regular check-in and assessments with students because they have to complete various um, um, modules within that um, year-long seminar to demonstrate growth throughout the program. So we can track how our kids are progressing on leading those career work 20 place, tw 21st work century skills as identified um, by PDE. So that's a part of NACTI. Oh, okay. So um, NACTI as part of the industry, 21st, right? That's actually those specific um, domains would be measured as part of the NACTI assessment. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Awesome, thanks. Um, that concludes my questions, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Epps. And um, Mr. Verdell Williams, I thought you would have some questions and uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Dang, I guess I'm pretty predictable. Um, but uh, just a few questions. Um, I appreciate the presentation, and um, I think everyone on the line who has, you know, heard me around this particular presentation, even prior to my my board experience, I'm 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 also always excited about the course offerings and looking at what we have available. As one community member, my daughter is going to be elated. Um, behind a number of the, the the courses that are listed here, as they are actually a place of her um, of her genuine career interest, and she wasn't exactly sure how she was going to gain that experience um, inside of school. So I'm grateful for that. I didn't know that this was happening, so I'm just excited as as one um, one community member. But um, to uh, to kind of go to my my first set of questions, uh, the first set is around the. Uh, the diversified occupations program you mentioned the NACTI certification that would come or that is you know an anticipated uh, result of successful completion of the program and like would what would the NACTI certification be in specifically is it in diversified occupations or yes, on the twenty first twenty first work century skills twenty first century work skills um, under the diversified occupations program that is a part of the CTE um, curriculum. Um, so Miss McKenna has been steadfast in ensuring that we have um, model our program exactly to the standards. Um, for approval by PDE, um, the, even down to our training plans and our agreements, um, all of our documents um, we follow. They give you know they give us templates, so it's not like we're kind of you know working in isolation. PDE provides materials for us to utilize, um, and like in a lot of high schools. Um, like we said, do not offer um, some of these comprehensive programs because. You know, most for the most part, our kids go to Eastern, but this is outside of the Eastern course offerings. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to hear that. I was just right. I met recently with the Eastern Center um, for Arts and Technology Joint Operating Committee, and one of the things that was brought to my attention that I I had never asked or inquired about, and maybe that was short sighted of me, but um, it was shared that about 40% of the students at Eastern are special education students or in some form of, of a special education service. I didn't know that. And so I'm, I'm curious as to um, what percentage uh, do we, what percentage of the prospective student population do we expect would be uh, special education students here or would it, or is this tailored more um, you know, again, as, as students who are, you know, again, maybe not uh, excited about any specific program of choice at Eastern. 
Well, exactly. And it's really about students' interests. Like, so um, we have a number of computer science, computer programming courses that we have expanded at the high school. So we have some students that are doing their co-op experience with, with um, companies where they have the opportunity to follow, continue that, um, that coursework in the real world. So it is open to all students. It's not limited to students who are special education. However, we do see a greater need for um, whether you're special ed or not, to provide this real world life experience prior to leaving high school. Um, we definitely see it as a complement to all of our students' um, educational experience. So we, we have special education students there who are currently enrolled in the program, but we also have regular education students that are enrolled in the program. Um, so our hope, our premise is that we're trying to do something that's beneficial for all students. And if you want specific numbers, I can get that for you. Yeah, that that would be nice. Again, I, it, it was pretty, I, I didn't understand, I guess, conceptually, it didn't click for me. But like, you know, seeing that the the number of students who, you know, attended Eastern and who were, um, you know, this was not specific to Cheltenham, I, I will say. Uh, but I, I am interested to understand, um, you know, our data uh, regarding, you know, our students who are attending Eastern and also who would be participating in this program, um, I, I, or or who we would expect to target with the program, um, and then also some some real world data would be would be awesome. Um, the the next question is again I, I may have should have asked this a little bit sooner regarding my 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 Nazi question, um, but this goes along with data points. I think it would be important to know. Um, you know, just in terms of like evaluating the quality of the program, like how many of our students are achieving that that NACTI certification. So what what if we're evaluating, you know, the qualitative aspect of the program, like I would expect that, you know, maybe 100%, um, you know, NACTI certification would be, you know, our goal. But I guess the, the question is, do we have a goal there? Uh, for NACTI certification for our students after they complete the program? Claire, we would love to have 100% of our students um, pass the NACTI exam, but we, we also know that there's always challenges. However, um, we will be able to provide more data once we like, this is our first year of the pilot. So we're, we're what, four months in the school. So we're four months in the program. And the fact that we have 18 out of our 21 students placed in co-op pro placements right now, to me is a good indicator of the success of the program. Um, so at the end of the school year, we'll be able to look at all of the, the collect the data and see how our students are performing and see the growth we made and be able to give you a more informed response to, to that question. Yeah, I think that's, all, that, that's great, especially for a program like this, right? I think. The, the, the other program, not, not saying that they are not important, but the other course offerings that were shared tonight, like I, I think that they are definitely a benefit. Um, and it just feels that this particular um, course offering or program, because it's a little bit greater than a course offering from, from my purview, um, you know, the, I think it, it lends itself to, you know, a little bit more from a qualitative perspective in terms of career readiness. I think it's more of a direct line to career readiness, like some of like the neuroscience, like my daughter's going to love that program, right? And she's going to have other opportunities to support her interest in, in neuroscience. But I think the student in the, in the diversified occupations program is likely going to be utilizing this program almost as a direct, you know, school to career um, type, of, um, type of pathway. So I think it would be important to understand um, the results or what, what, how are we doing um, in terms of being able to uh, provide that environment where the students can gain their certification. I will say it's very great. I, I love hearing that 18 of 21 students are placed because I know how hard that process is um, just getting like qualified, you know, folks to approve co-ops and especially in the climate of COVID and the challenges behind, you know, the number of, of, of uh, just available folks to help out um, by, um, you know, assisting with that co-op from a company side perspective. Um, that is, that's very impressive. And, um, you know, kudos to the team um, who have helped out to ensure that that's the case. Um, the last thing is you mentioned that this was a pilot um, and I may have missed this in the, the rest of the presentation, but 
the the other than this program are are all of the other course offerings happening now or are they expected to happen with the beginning of the next semester i guess i didn't hear anything regarding timing um, the rest of the rest of the courses will be implemented beginning with next school year because why we're coming to you now so that we can put them in a course selection um, guide for next year this particular program the diverse diverse occupations program we 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 ran this basically under the current um um uh, I'm sorry, sorry um under a current course that was running the pilot and the fact that we were able to get enrolled those particular students came from conversations with counselors and teachers around what they um students were looking to do for their senior year because we have a lot of, we have seniors who um have the core of their graduation requirements you know relatively early sometimes so this was a great opportunity for students to get some work-based experience prior to either going to off to college or deciding they're going to pursue um, a career interest. Um, and with that, with the Diversity Occupies program, um, we also have partnerships. We're working on partnerships with MyCo for college credit and along working with um, as Arcadia as one of our community partners as well. Yeah, I love that we're continuing to find ways to partner with Arcadia. Um, I I appreciate that. Thank you for responding to my litany of questions and I appreciate you again. Uh, and thank you for introducing and sharing with us um, all of these course offerings. I know the students will be extremely excited. I know one in particular um, who <laughs> lives with me who will be particularly excited. Thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bordell Williams and Ms. Collins. Um, are there any other board members who have their hands raised for questions on this section? I see Mr. Epps. Sorry, I did have one that I forgot uh, that I hadn't written down. Um, in the La Latino and African American literature, uh, my assumption is that some of those authors, uh, students, and scholars would be exposed to as part of US history or something else. Would you, um, could someone share to what extent some of the African American literature, Latino American literature is included um, as part of US history course offerings? Well, currently our history courses are relatively um, traditional in the sense that it really focuses upon history as through the movement. I'm not really necessarily incorporating the actual literature from select authors of the time. And primary resources are utilized, but not necessary um, text. Um, what we have done this particular school year is invested um, in diverse, in diverse um, text for all of our English classrooms, seven through 12, um, which allow for a more in-depth study a multi um, of multiple authors um, from diverse backgrounds and based on various themes throughout our courses and grades nine, um, nine through seven through 12 in, in, in English language arts. Thank you um, for that around ELA and that history. Uh, appreciate and, and having spoken with um, Ms. Collins briefly, actually, um, a few months ago about the some of the new books that have come in for um, our ELA classes, there's some incredibly diverse titles there, um, exciting titles, actually, both at the high school and at CBK. Um, I think our teachers are doing a really great job of finding books that are reflective of the students whom we serve. So. Um, and and we're you know the, the administration is supporting them in those choices thanks that was my assumption <laughs> and so <laughs> I, i'm a fan of making things explicit so i appreciate the elaboration <laughs> and thank you for the continue because that is all of ultimate importance right as we um even when we get back to think about the other topics you mentioned earlier and for what and cedarbrook did a great post of with those books on instagram if you want to find it it's from a few months ago they have stacks of when the books came in and so you can see all of them and i was like super i mean it's actually <laughs> um, in my in my professional capacity of, of all of those books so um so that was great so thank you um ms collins um and if there are no other questions from board members um and i if there's any questions from the attendees um please raise your hand we can unmute you um 
And I would also just like to give a shout out to Ms. McKenna for all of the hard work that she's done on making the Diversified Occupations Program a reality. It's incredibly impressive what one person, it sounds like, has managed to, to do um, for the students at CHS. So thank you for that, Ms. McKenna. Um, and I don't see any questions from the attendees. And the other, one other random little tidbit I'm going to throw out there is that at my high school, the one course that everyone had to have to graduate was swimming. There was no getting around it. You had to have it you, um, in order to graduate and get your high school diploma from my high school. So kids at CHS should know how good they have it. Now they have it as an elective, but they don't have to take it first period if they don't want to. Um, so, um, it was, it was a real experience, but it's a great class and I'm actually very glad that we're offering it. So thank you for that. So we'll move on. Um, I guess Dr. Smith or Ms. Collins to the next portion of the presentation. Okay. So next we have the Shoreham High School graduation requirements. Currently the class of 2022, this is the graduation requirements, uh, as you can see on the screen. However, now that we have a modified schedule, our students now have the potential to earn uh, at least eight credits per school per um, school year, which means they could earn up to 32 credits prior to graduation. Um, so for the class of 2023, um, we are going to maintain the same core subject requirements as required for the class of 2022. However, the electives will increase. So instead of needing 23 credits to graduate, they will need 25 credits to graduate. For the class of 2024, which is our current sophomore class and beyond, these will be the revised graduation requirements, four years of English, four years of math, four years of science, four years, four credits, I'm sorry, I say years, four credits of social studies, one credit of PE, um, half a credit of health, one credit of world language, and nine and a half elective credits. For a total of 28 credits needed for graduation. And like I said previously, our kids had the opportunity to earn up to 32 credits prior to graduating. So for the class of 2024 and beyond, you would need seven credits to become a sophomore, 14 credits to become a junior, and 21 credits to become a senior. The implementation timeline is as follows. Obviously for the class of 2022, there's no change. For the class of 2023, they will need the 25 credits to graduate. And they must meet, like I said prior, the core requirements of the class of 2022, plus two additional elective credits. The class of 2024 and beyond must earn 28 credits to graduate. Question, Ms. Lohman? Thank you, Ms. Collins. Um, first, again, I'll open up to any board member questions. If you have any questions about this, the credit, the credit requirement changes, please raise your hand. Or if attendees do, you can raise your hand or put a question in the Q&A. Uh, Ms. Henry, I see that you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you for this update, uh, Ms. Collins. A question, um, when you have students coming from other districts where there may be different require graduation requirements, how does the current, how, how are we able to support those students so they can still graduate on time if they have a deficit? So, Ms. so it, it depends. We always evaluate on a case by case basis, depending on, on the student and what their transcripts were prior to or the requirements were from where they came from. For the most part, if they are um, coming in um, after completing freshman and sophomore year, they should be able to meet because right, like I said, right now you get eight credits, you can earn eight credits per year. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, our students will have the opportunity to make up those credits. We also um, offer times like right now, we have students who come in who are credit deficient. 
We provide opportunities like we do now for credit recovery. So we work with each family on a case-by-case -case basis to ensure that the kids, that we're not penalizing students. We won't say, oh, your school only offered um, seven, you only were only able to take seven credits, or you're not gonna be, um, you only take 14, well, if they have 14, most schools offer seven credits. So if they take seven and seven is 14, they would still meet the requirement. Like if they're on younger grades, but we have a kid that's coming in, let's say their senior year, We'll work with the kids just to give them credit for what they have based on the graduation requirements where they came from and to ensure that we that they meet our standards for that senior year or junior, wherever they are. So we do want to, that happens now, but we just do it on a case by case basis. We evaluate these students' transcript. How different is it across this? Is there a state like sort of standard around how many credits, graduation credit students need, or does that depend on just the district that you're in? The district defines the graduation credits. The state tells us the minimum credits required in each area. Yeah. Okay. All right, that's all I had. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Henry. Um, Ms. Haywood, did I see your hand? You. I had it up and um, Ms. Henry asked, asked uh, the question that I had, but I guess I wanna understand um, how this, these credit offerings compare to other neighboring school districts, particularly as relates to the electives. Um, I look at our world language offering. I'd like to see, you know, I like um, the progression of the additional science and math requirement by 2024. You know, quite frankly, I think it's a good thing because I think we're moving into more of a STEM um, world. And I think we need to prepare our students for that. Um, but I think we also are moving into very kind of, you know, global um, world as well. And I know that we only have the one credit for world language um, and, you know, a requirement by 2024 to have 9.5 credits and electives. I'm just trying to understand how this compares with other school districts um, in terms of the elective requirement as opposed to weighing it more heavily on things like a world language. I, I still would love to push for Mandarin or for, and I say this all the time, and for um, Arabic. I mean, these are languages that are world languages that we don't offer and we have never offered. So I just put that plug in again, but just curious in terms of how this compares to other school districts. Ms. Hay, yes, Ms. Haywood, and, and I know you're a plug for Mandarin and um, Arabic, and it, trust me, it has not gone unheard. Uh, we are definitely looking on ways to do that, but also being mindful um, of our current um, budget constraints. Um, so I am um, just look for next year. Let's, However, with that being said, what we, um, in terms of our course offerings, we looked at other schools that offer um, a modified schedule similar to ours to see what they require. And in addition to that, um, most districts do not require a world language requirement is in that elective category. We require the one year hoping to garner interest for students um, that may have maybe, you know, outside of our students that we know we start offering in seventh and eighth grade at Cedarbrook, but we also get kids who come in from other um, school districts as well, as well. So providing opportunities for our students to take advantage of our, our world languages. We are looking to expand those course offerings, um, but ensuring that we can do it um, in the way that we, that we, like I said, remain mindful of what um, our current uh, budget constraints are. So our most districts do what we have structured here is put the additional credits and electives knowing that student that elective could be additional AP classes in the history, AP um, world language. They can take all four years of world language in the AP class. They can take, if they're an art student, they can take more advanced art classes um, and things of that nature. So most districts dump um, uh, the, 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 high, the number of electives. So it gives kids more options to decide what they want to do in terms of planning for their future. Um, we brought in the one year of world language and our last um, round of um, high school graduation requirements um, under the former principal, we brought that, we proposed that one year weren't language so each teacher, each student could at least have an experience. And we've invested um, 
a lot of professional development hours this past school year and at the end of last school year on um, a, a new model for approaching world language instruction to ensure that all of our students can engage in a learning experience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ms. Haywood and, and Ms. Collins. Um, I don't see any community members with hands raised or other questions about this particular part of the presentation. So I, I'd just like to ask a question to either Ms. Collins or Dr. Smith about um, before we get to the last part of the of the presentation this evening, we have a community member who's been patiently waiting with a long series of questions in the Q&A. And I'm wondering if we should take those now or would you like me to hold off on them till the end? I think it's appropriate to take them now. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna read them out loud. Um, and so we have them in the record. Um, these questions come from Susan Becker who lives in the Elkins Park section of Cheltenham. Um, she's the parent of a CHS, at CHS 11th grader. Um, and she has a series of questions about block scheduling. Um, she's also happy to ask them verbally if necessary. So we can also unmute her if we've got some questions about um, what she's asking. Her first question is, uh, does the district plan to report to CHS parents about how the program is working? Is there any plan to change the system for the coming school year? Was there research into the different kinds of block scheduling used in various school districts? And how was the decision made to use these this particular system, such as classes every other day and other than languages and AP classes, only half your classes? Many school districts use block schedules, but it seems to be an outlier that math and English unless AP are only for one semester. Similarly, our periods seem longer than other school districts. Has there been an analysis of whether this is an optimal time for classes or whether this is the optimal time for classes? Will the intervention period continue? And if so, has the district evaluated whether this is a good use of the time? And then I understand that because there are only four blocks, there are many fewer opportunities for students to take this class as they want. And many were forced to choose between language, music, and other required classes. Is there a plan to address this issue for next year? And finally, if there's not a plan to change anything, does the cost of teachers planning role in the decision? Um, I appreciate your attention to these issues. And again, look forward to the answers being shared in the wider school community. So those are lots of very important and um, wow, detailed questions, which could probably be the focus of their own presentation. Um, <laughs> so I don't know how you want to handle this, Dr. Smith or, Dr. or Ms. Collins, but. Um, I'll start and then um, Ms. Collins, if you want, I'll pass to you, unless you want to go in reverse order. No, that's fine, you can start. Okay, so just to start, um, prior to us going to the flexible schedule at the high school, we did um, present multiple um, presentations to the community as well as um, had collaborative conversations um, with our teachers at the middle school and the high school level. So I wanna just give a just that quick background that we've been very um, intentional to include um, teachers, to include um, teacher union leadership in these conversations as well as the high school and CBK administration. So I wanna make sure that everyone is clear that this is something that came from um, a collaborative um, effort and it was not something that central office kind of passed down. Specifically, do we plan to report to CHS parents about how the program is working? We are going to use that as an Ed Affairs um, topic before the, clue, before the conclusion of the school year because it is a new initiative. And that's typically what we do when we have new initiatives is to make sure that we give some type of follow-up. So to answer question one, yes, we do have a plan to report out about the new schedule. Um, and as our board members know, we invested as a district um, a lot of money and a lot of time into um, the schedule um, to make sure that this is something that's working um, for our students. So we do have a plan to come back and to circle back to see, um, uh, to let people know how it's going, so to speak. You have anything else to add to question one, Ms. Collins? No, you hit you hit the points that I would have addressed, Dr. Smith. Okay. And then question two, is there any plan to change the system for the coming school year? Meaning, will we change anything about the flexible schedule? To, to, as of today, um, December 21st, 
We do not have any plans um, to change um, the schedule. We the, the schedule that we have now was over two years in the making. It, it was not something that we did overnight. Uh, we, we were very, um, as I said earlier, very intentional. We took some very key steps to make sure that all of the key people were at the, at the table. And I would say as with anything new that you begin, um, you know, there, there are some things that we're looking at that will probably modify or change or approach differently. But if the question is, is there any plan to change the overall system holistically? No, at this time, there is no plan to change the overall system for the coming school year. Ms. Collins or anyone from the high school have anything to add to the question too? I was just going to say we continue to evaluate what the schedule is and there are suggestions and we have recommendations that we're considering for the upcoming school year. But like Dr. Smith stated, um, at this current time, we are going to um, work within the schedule we currently have developed, um, continue to monitor, get feedback and evaluate the effectiveness and then any changes that will be made because when you make those types of large changes, especially with a high school schedule, it requires much more time than we would have now to, to make the, the appropriate changes to ensure that we um, maximize um, the learning opportunities for all our students. Thank you. And then question three, was there research into the different kinds of black scheduling used in various school districts and how was the decision made to use this particular system, i.e. classes every other day, um, and other than languages, AP classes, only half year classes. So yes, there was a significant amount of research that went into this um, to this uh, new schedule. And again, I, I think two years is probably conservative. I know we talked about it longer than that, but we actually started to engage teachers, teachers um, and our CEA leadership at, at the middle school and the high school, they were at the table for every step of this conversation. Um, and when I say at the table for every step of this conversation, myself, Ms. Collins and other central office staff, we participated as um, participants. We did not lead the conversation. We were a part of the conversation. The conversation was led by external consultants that were hand selected and picked by the teachers union. So we wanted to make sure that as we move forward with the schedule that we had buy-in and we had collaboration from the very beginning and we work with um, Solution Tree, which um, you can look up um, or we can actually post it if you'd like as a part of this presentation. Um, they, they are um, nationally known for all of their professional development and their resources. We also used um, an international scheduler um, for this project. So yes, a lot of research went into it, a lot of collaboration went into it. And we did look at the different kinds of blocks that different um, school districts use. Um, Ms. Collins um, led that effort in terms of reaching out to other Montgomery County school districts and high schools in order to see what they were using, what they liked about it, what they didn't like about it. And we also encouraged our teachers as a part of this conversation to reach out to any colleagues that they may have had to see how they feel about um, different schedules. And as a parent of a high schooler, I will tell you that this the model that we're using is very similar to what um, my own high schooler is using. And it has been um, really effective um, with her and her and her plan. And one of the things, because we're just getting started that we're not seeing dividends from yet, but we will, some of our children will be able to accelerate or catch up um, to, in courses as a result of this particular schedule. For example, you could take two math courses um, in one school year. You could take, you know, for example, let's say for whatever reasons, um, as a student, I didn't qualify for algebra at seventh grade, and I didn't qualify for algebra at eighth grade, but I want to be an engineer. I want to apply to STEM majors when I go to college. I want to catch up to students who took those courses earlier. This type of schedule allows me to take algebra the first half of the year, geometry the second half of the year, and I can catch up to my classmates and have algebra two by sophomore year and kind of never miss a beat. And it also allows you to take more than one language. Um, if I wanted to take Spanish and French or Spanish and German, or hopefully um, we'll manifest um, what Ms. Uh, Hayward mentioned, Mandarin and something else, we could do that all um, at the same time and really get those things done. And so when you look at different high school transcripts, we are very much um, in line to what other um, high performing districts and um, are offering, especially to students who are college bound or to students, the schedule also helps our students who um, want to focus on some of the um, courses that Eastern offers 
um, so that they're not missing um, some of their core courses the way the schedule is um, laid out. And, and because there's it, this question specifically asked about schedule, you know what, let me go back to the next question and then I'll, I'll um, defer to Mr. Hammond, Dr. Hammond, because he was the, the, the main schedule at the high school. Question four kind of lends itself to question three as well. Many school districts use block schedule, but it seems to be an outlier that math and English are only for one um, semester. So what I'd like to do, and then, and then question five, our periods seem longer than other school districts had that been announced. I hold question five, three and four, Dr. Hammond, do you want it, you or Mr. Hoff want to speak to, um, you know, how often the classes meet and also the fact that, um, that math and, and uh, English are for one semester. Dr. Smith, can I say one thing before that? Absolutely, yeah. I just want to add that those choices of how those courses were offered was the recommendations from the actual departments within the high school. So that the fact that we're running some courses every other day and some courses by semester, that was what was recommended from the actual high school teaching staff. And therefore that's what we implemented. We, and we did definitely looked at different models and at different schools they have every other day. And some people have some had semesters. So we like, we're living through this schedule right now. We're working it out. Dr. Hammond can speak, um, or Mr. Hoff can also add to that piece I just stated, but we're definitely looking to see, um, you know, what we could possibly modify moving forward, what we think needs to happen, but um, we're keeping our list of possible recommendations just to see how the whole year manifests in terms of living within our new schedule. Dr. Hammond? No, um, you actually said exactly what I was going to say. The this was a very much a collaborative process. And it was even at the beginning stages, world language was gonna be a semester course. And in talking with Happer or Horsham, they, they did not see any issues with um, loss of skill in having the course in a semester, but uh, staying true to the collaboration, we, we went with the um, advice of the team to keep it in a year long course. And, um, you know, so <clears throat> three and four, again, we, you know, a lot of time was spent doing this and it was purposeful to the group in what the, what worked best for the high school in how we picked these courses in the semester versus the year long courses. And for me personally, the semester courses, as Dr. Smith said, provides our scholars with the opportunity to make up courses and to accelerate in courses. If you have the year longs, it's gone and goes back to our traditional schedule. It's just in a block format. And in that traditional schedule, you're stuck with that year long course. And if you don't do well, you now have to spend a whole nother year trying to make that up. Or if you know, for example, um, if you did not take a course in Cedarbrook, you will never make it to the AP. You can never get to that upper level of a course and having the semester courses and the reason why we went with the semester courses was to provide our scholars with that opportunity to be able to get to that end result, even though they didn't start in the middle school. And that is very important to me because just because you weren't there in that mindset as a middle school student, I know I was not in that mindset as a middle school student, does not mean that I'm not ready for it as a high school student. And it is very important to provide that opportunity. And so I'm, I'm very grateful that we went with the, the, the schedule that we are with. Yes, we are, there are some recommendations for tweaks to make it better and to keep making it better and to look at how the courses are laid out so that certain year long courses that students wanna take, you know, if they wanna take that AP Latin with an AP um, English, that I make sure in building the schedule that that is there and in, that, in the format so that it will work. Um, you know, little things like that, that I have to tweak and make sure that it's better for different options and different layouts, but I do believe that we, we, we hit the nail on the head in, in, in changing to a modified schedule 
from our traditional seven, seven period schedule. Thank you. Anyone else from the high school want to chime in before I move to question five? Okay. Question five. Similarly, our period seemed longer than other school districts. Has there been an analysis of whether this is the optimal time for classes? And I will tell you, we haven't done an, an analysis on how it's been working this particular school year, but prior to this being recommended as our time frame, there was an analysis done by the consultants that we work with. So whether or not this is great for Sheltonham or not is to be determined. And I think Ms. Collins spoke to ongoing review and ongoing revisiting of how this will go. And so I would say for a future presentation, that is a question that we can absolutely address about the minutes, how they're being used. And also um, I think with, the, with always with the block schedule and someone who is taught in a block schedule as a teacher, I, I would offer that there is more professional learning and more training that we're also going to be providing to our staff in order to use that time um, to the best um, uh, that we have. Anyone else from the high school or Ms. Collins want to answer five before we go to six? Okay, six, will the intervention period continue? And if so, has the dis district evaluated whether this is a good use of time? Yes, the intervention period um, will continue um, we have evaluated that this is a good use of time. Again, that was a part of um, our collaboration with um, our teachers, our teachers union, our school level administrators, and also our outside consultants. But as an, uh, uh, a further um, answer to that question, as we've been saying, this is the first year, it is new. Um, Ms. Collins and I, we met, I wanna say as recent as yesterday to talk about some tweaks we wanna to make to the intervention period as we go into January, 2022. And um, actually Dr. Scriven and I, our, our superintendent, we met today and I reviewed those recommendations with him as well. So we are um, watching this very closely. And even before tonight's meeting, these conversations have taken place between myself and Dr. Lahara, myself and Ms. Collins, um, all of us collaboratively, we've been talking about what's working, what's not working. Myself and Dr. Scriven, we met with um, our teacher union leadership. They also raised some concerns about the intervention period. So this, this has been um, an open dialogue and we're not closing the door to any changes, any modifications or recommendations. However, yes, we will continue the intervention period. However, the way it looks now today is going to change for the next year. We already have, a, when I say the next year, I mean the next calendar year, not school year, January, 2022, we will see some changes there. And we will also um, continue to evaluate and make changes and make modifications um, as necessary. Is there anything else anyone wants to add to question six before I move forward? Ms. Collins, Mr. Hoff, Dr. Heyman. Okay. Um, I understand that because there are only four blocks, there are fewer opportunities for students to take the classes that they want. Many were forced to change between, choose between language and music. Is there a plan to address this issue for next year? And, and I will say um, that every year, and, and that's how I feel as a parent too, every year I feel like students are, are kind of always boxed in to pick something over something else because with scheduling, you kind of almost never get everything that you want. Um, and, and that is happening with this schedule as well. And I, I'll actually defer to Dr. Hammond because I know you do the schedule and he has a better grasp on how many students this has impacted than I do. So I'd rather allow you to speak to that, Dr. Hammond, specifically about if, if that's a big concern and um, how we can address it. So you are correct. Every year, forget about being in this modified schedule. Let's go back to the traditional schedule we had every year there was an issue with our singletons. Our singletons meaning a course that only is offered one time in the day in one specific period. And when you have multiple of those singletons, it is very hard to get all of the singletons that you want in your schedule at the exact same time because some might be overlapping. And now when you put into perspective exactly what you wrote there, which is language and music, music, there's 2.5 music teachers, 2.3 music teachers in the high school. And 
your upper level languages, almost all of them are singletons. And the music classes, because they want all of their scholars to be in the same class to perform together, those courses are singletons. And so, yes, it is very difficult to always have those run together. Being in the modified schedule, you now have an extra period in the schedule so that there's one extra placement a course can go so you have a better chance of getting it. Um, one thing that I've asked the counselors for this year, as we are already starting to plan in the request and scheduling process, is that um, I will be asking them to, when they are sitting with each scholar and building out the requests, they're going to be filling out a spreadsheet for me on the, you know, the odd requests. You know, I need to be in select choir and AP Latin and um, I need this other course for graduation so that as I build out the schedule and I look at the best placement for courses, I can try to maximize those requests um, better than just having it run in the system and then building it out based on our rooming uh, room needs. But that is always going to be an issue. We have so many options at the high school so many courses, which is something we're very prideful that we have, but it's also a curse at the same time because you can't get everything you want. There's always going to be a choice. Sorry for the long-winded answer. No, thank you for that, Dr. Hammond. And then the last question is finally, if there is not a plan to change anything, does the cost of teachers play any role in the decision? And the answer to that is no, the cost of teachers do not does not play a role in the decision to make um, changes. Um, again, I just wanna repeat again that, that we spent a lot of time, um, a little over two years prior to implementing this system. So this wasn't something that we did you know, um, lightly or without um, advisement internally and external um, advisement as we move forward. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith and Dr. Hammond and Ms. Collins um, for, for answering um, those questions. I, uh, there are a lot, that's a lot to unpack there. I appreciate that there will be another presentation later in the school year with regard to sort of updates on how the block scheduling is proceeding. I would, if it's okay, just like to open this up to board member questions if anybody has any, you know, questions about anything that was just mentioned. don't see any hands um and i would also i cannot remember but i know that we had we had had several presentations about the flexible scheduling um to the ed affairs as well i think is maybe even during a legislative board meeting so um there is there is definitely information up on the school district's website about sort of some of the considerations that went into uh developing the flexible scheduling uh mr epps did i see a hand? No. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I think then, th um, and then I should also say, Ms. Becker, is there anything else you wanted to add or respond before we move on? If so, you can, um, you know, raise your hand and we can unmute you. I do see, okay. I see your hand raised. Um, so now you can unmute yourself. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thanks so much for answering my questions. I very much appreciate it. I, I just wanted to clarify about a future presentation and whether that will be made available to the high school parents in a more accessible format. I mean, it, it takes a lot to attend a school board meeting. And of course, I'm happy to do so. I think there are a lot of parents who have questions and concerns about block scheduling and how it works um, and would appreciate hearing about the process that led us to us and, and, and the decision making process and how it's working. So it seems to me it should be in the format of a 
um, you know, kind of like curriculum night or back to school night, something where everyone is informed that there's going to be a presentation so that um, parents can, you know, hear about this in, uh, in an easier format. So I just wanted to make sure that that's on the agenda for the high school. And thanks very much. I appreciate your, your thoughts. Dr. Hammond, do you want to speak to that? Because I, I do recall that um, that there were some parent level meetings um, around the new schedule. Well, I was going to just say that um, January 19th is our curriculum night. Um, it will be virtual, but that is the night where you will learn all about scheduling. We also plan to meet with your scholars, um, eighth grade separately, and then the high school just to talk about the schedule and how it's laid out and how you pick your courses. Um, so that's the, really the most important time to really learn about what can be taken together and to, to start that process. So that's gonna start January 19th when we talk to the parents. And then that's when I start building the schedule. Did that kind of answer what you were asking for or you, wanted, you were looking for something different, Ms. Becker? No, that, that's helpful. I, I would just note that I am a parent who, you know, I read everything, I follow everything, I listened to curriculum night last year, and I recall being introduced to this concept of block scheduling, but I really did not have an understanding until I looked at the schedule. And it took me a long time to understand that there was only going to be English for one semester and math for one semester. I mean, I, I don't feel like parents really understood what this was all about. And I, I understand that there was this very long process and lots of buy-in and I really appreciate hearing that, but I don't think that that has been fully shared with the community of parents. And it seems to me that that would be helpful to give a much fuller presentation of how this all came to be and the thought process behind it and how it's working and all of that. And so I, I understand that from your point of view, you feel you know, rightly so that there's been all this time invested in it. But I do think that parents did not really understand exactly how all of this came to be and that there were like, you know, even a parent who was really paying attention, I don't think really quite kind of understood the the you know significance of this change. And I think it's important for the, the high school community or the Cedar Brook and the high school community to get a much fuller picture of what all this is about. So I think it's great to talk about it at curriculum night, but curriculum night is covering a whole bunch of other topics as well. Right. And I, I just think it's important to consider a much fuller presentation about how this all works. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Becker, um, and, and thank you for those comments. Um, I mean, as a parent of a, as one taking off my board member hat for a second, and as a parent of a, of a child at the high school, I, those, your comments do reflect the comments that I have received from people in my community as well, that they, um, were, surprised if you will by by the changes i think um it, it and and i think that sometimes we forget as board members and as staff members while we're knee deep in a lot of this work the parents are not um and so um when things kind of come about even though there may have been at affairs meetings and there may have been um other you know references to this kind of work at legislative meetings when it actually get it gets implemented, right, is when people actually pay attention to it. And so I think that, um, you know, perhaps um, moving forward, we could we could figure out how to, you know, make this a little bit clearer to folks so there's a little less surprise. Um, and and now we also have a, a year with people having it under their belts too. So I, hopefully that will help as well. Um, so thank you for those comments. Um, and I will open it up to the last part of the presentation. Okay, thank you. All right, so our last presentation for the evening is the course to be sequencing for grades seven through 12 social studies. 
Our current course sequence is on uh, the screen. As you can see, um, currently in seventh grade, they do geography. Um, eighth grade, which is intro to civics, uh, government and action, they do a little bit of um, civics, uh, economics, um, early US history. Ninth grade, we have world cultures. 10th grade, we have world history. 11th grade, we have United States history. And then electives students can take uh, for 12th grade. Um, our proposed new course sequence is to move world cultures down to seventh grade. Um, just so everyone knows, currently, with even with the world cultures course we currently offer at the high school, even when I'm making an attempt to have students, if they need credit recovery or some sort, the actual course that it aligns with um, through the standards is actually a geography course. So we wanna move world cultures to its correct place, which is seventh grade. We will maintain the eighth grade course. Um, ninth grade um, and 10th grade, we are separating currently US history over two years. As it is presently um, given, we don't even make it to um, the, the 21st century in United States history. Um, we stop around 1970s, I believe, 1980s, and Mr. Hall um, has joined me on the panel as well this evening. Um, so we are splitting this into two years with a revision. We'll be focusing on curriculum developing, development to make sure that all of the social studies courses are presented from multiple stakeholders perspectives versus one um, perspective as currently being offered. Um, grade 11, we're gonna move world history to grade 11 and then offer numerous electives, which as you know, because of our course ske schedule at the high school, I told you earlier, they can take eight credits per year. They can take electives throughout. Um, one of those required electives will be the civics and government course that students can take upon completion of US history two. in addition to our numerous AP courses that can be taken throughout our students' time here. So if a student wants to take AP US history, they could take that in place of United States history too. They will be able to take AP world history and a host of a, a number of elective AP history courses that we offer at the high school. So this will not um, by any means eliminate any of our current course offerings. We are just doing a restructure and resequencing to best um, meet the needs of our current student population and to ensure that all of our students have the opportunity to be successful in our more rigorous courses um, and um, advanced placement offerings as well. Um, thank you, Ms. Collins. Um, I'll open it up to uh, board member questions. I see Mr. Fishbein, you have your hand raised. Yes. I'm Thank you for this. Actually, thank everyone for all of the presentations, but this is interesting, this, this new sequence. And I, I appreciate the improvement that it makes. The question I have is the, the asterisk, civics and government upon completion of US history two. Does that mean that's covered at the end of US history two every, for every student? Or am I misinterpreting that? What we're saying is once course students have completed US history one, US history two, they can then they that's the prerequisite for the civics and government elective course that they can take at any time once they have completed those two courses, US history two. Does everybody have to take one version of all of everything in the sequence up to eleven? Well, some, some, some students may take United States history too. Instead of taking that, they may take AP US history. Right, so, right. right. That's why I said some version of it, but yes. But yes. So, okay. I, I was, and everybody's taking the intro to civics in eighth grade. That's, Correct. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Hoff, I think you wanted to comment. Uh, you've covered, said exactly what I was going to say. Okay. Mr. Cohen, I see your hand raised. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm glad this is being talked about. Um, and thank you, everybody, for the presentations. In terms of U.S. History 1, U.S. History 2, in addition to being able to teach beyond the 1970s, 
I assume that will then give some more time, more flexibility, not to, not to pad the classes, but to delve into things a little more deeply. My question some rhetorically is um, trying to look at the different resources we have in Philadelphia and also in Cheltenham in terms of the history in our backyard and in Philadelphia's backyard to make use of those resources in terms of both formal museums and also other resources we have around US history, both what's being taught or has been taught historically and also some other points of view and some other cultures that to be represented as well. So I just want to throw that out there rhetorically and say that I hope in terms of US history that those are going to be looked at and explored even to a greater way than might be done now in terms of having more time to do so possibly. Thank you. Yes, 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 we are. We also plan on working with our community partners, not only with the local museums, but our university partners as well, Arcadia University and University of Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. That's a good point. Um, we are so fortunate to have so much um, incredible history within walking distance, really, of, of many of our schools. So it's great. All right. Thank you, Mr. Um, Cohen and Mr. Burdell Williams. I see your hand raised. Yeah, this is just very brief. Um, I, I have a sixth grader, and I'm just, you know, considerate of the. Uh, the interest level or attention span of of a, of a seventh grader when it comes to world cultures versus that of geography like I just I guess just thinking about just generally speaking if we are you know targeting the educational experience for the the, the student and and I'm just thinking like I, I'm curious as to how interesting world cultures is going to be to our seventh graders I'm sure it'll be fun um, but I I I think like, I just I, I see a challenge in that, and I'm just curious: is had there been any thought about, um, you know, ways to leverage any, you know, any, you know, uh, I won't call it 21st century learning necessarily, but just any, um, just any interesting, innovative ways to, um, to 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 deliver the uh, the the information there to our students. Yes, um, we had, I met with our seventh grade social studies team um, and they are a dynamic team. And with that being said, because their focus currently is geography with the world cultures piece, the actual English um, thematic units in seventh grade is who am I? So drawing on where we come from, who we are, where we belong, is a direct connection to what our students will be learning in their ELA classes that we will continue on into our social studies curriculum. So we'll be working to revise. It will not, they will not be presenting the curriculum as currently presented at the high school. They will be working to develop new curriculum starting in, Janu in January 2022 over the, um, the second half of the school year and throughout the summer for implementation for next school year. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, right? I just just could just being considerate of the fact that the the design of the course for the ninth graders and, and Mr. Hoff may have even, you know, more more uh, you know, firsthand working knowledge of it, but I just feel like the course design for ninth graders would likely be less interesting for a seventh grader. If I, you know, I'm, I'm just guessing. Um I I I, 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 I with the same age brackets there. Yeah, I don't think you need to guess. I can say yes. It would not be. It would not be as functional. The um, the current ninth grade course, uh, the course framework is really from the 1990s, um, and so there is a, a significant historical aspect to it that you would not normally place into a seventh grade curriculum. The strength there is the thematic piece, um, and so by putting in seventh grade, you're going to have the ability to use those thematic frames lock it in with the, the ELA component. Um, and so have the students explore different regions of the world, but probably do it in a more thematic group way of doing it. And the seventh grade team is gonna develop it. And some of those history pieces, as those of you who've had um, scholars go through the history program, there was redundancy between world cultures and world history. Um, and so we're going to be able to identify the most significant history pieces looking at the world history standards and make sure that's in that 11th grade course where the students are, you know, they've gone, gone through some more intellectual development. Um, and we're hoping that'll be a successful place for uh, world history to kind of live and thrive. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that perspective um, for sure. Thank you. Um, do I have any other questions from any more board members? Do I have any hands raised? I 
Let's see, any more hands? Um, and I think the remaining attendees may all be school district employees. Yeah. So um, <laughs> you can have a question too. <laughs> um, but if I don't um, see any more hands raised, um, then I think that um, we have come to the end of our time together. Um, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Smith, Ms. Collins, Mr. Hoff, Dr. Hammond for your time tonight, especially um, during this, this busy season before um, winter break begins. And we really appreciate your time and all, the, all of the information provided in tonight's presentation. Um, I also wanna say that um, on behalf of um, Ms. Henry and myself, we will be stepping down as committee co-chairs um, this will be our, our last meeting as committee co-chairs, and the new co-chairs will be Ms. Henry and Ms. Mulhern starting in January. So thank you very much for... Um, two corrections, two corrections, Jenny. One is, one is, it's Ms. Hayward and Ms. Mulhern. Oh, I'm sorry. What did I say? <laughs> and I will be doing the report out at the next le legislative meeting, so... All right. That won't be a complete end of <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> sorry, it's oh, getting late. I'm sorry. March, but they'll they'll be running the meeting in fe in uh, February. Excuse me, in January, but they'll be running the meeting in February. Okay, gotcha. Here we go. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, and I hope that everyone has a really good holiday season and has a chance to have a break and relax. So, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved, Charles. But oh, you got it, Charles. Second, Joel Fishbein. Thank you, and the meeting is adjourned. Take care, everyone. Madam.